Guys, I got great news. The Freeport LNG terminal in Texas is shut down due to an explosion. Guys, I got terrible news. The Freeport LNG terminal in Texas is shut down due to an explosion. Oh, and Canada has shut down 60% of the Russian Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline. So, why is the same news good for Americans but bad for Europeans? I will explain all of this and give a very simple breakdown of the natural gas imports and exports between the US, Europe, and Russia to see if the talk of replacing Russian natural gas with the US or other suppliers is even possible. Usually when an oil or gas facility shuts down from a fire or emergency, the price tends to increase when supplies are tight. That is the exact opposite of what happened in natural gas prices when the Freeport LNG terminal shut down. If you don't already know, the Freeport LNG natural gas liquefaction plant in Texas had an explosion that damaged some of their pipes from the storage tanks to their docks. Originally, they said they would be down for three weeks, but now they say they will have a partial restart in 90 days and not be back to full operation until the end of 2022. Now, Freeport supplies about 16% of the U.S. LNG exports. So this made the price of natural gas futures drop almost 20% in the U.S., but it skyrocketed in Europe. So how is this possible? Well, let's start from the beginning of what this terminal actually is. The Freeport LNG terminal takes natural gas, cools it to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, which turns the gas into a liquid and shrinks the volume by 600 times. Then they load it onto a ship that can be owned by maybe a utility in Japan or a gas company or just chartered by an energy trading company. So they ship it to destinations where they can sell it for more than the cost of the natural gas, the daily shipping rates, the shipping fuel, and other expenses. But this only works if the prices they can get in other countries is a good amount higher than all of their costs to deliver it. Right now, the price of natural gas is about five times higher than in the U.S., and so because of this, LNG terminals in the U.S. have been busy pushing as much LNG onto ships as they can. So when Freeport shut down, they stopped about 16% of all LNG leaving the U.S. This means that Europe has less natural gas coming in, which leads to higher prices. It also means that the natural gas inventories in the U.S. will grow bigger and that is why the price of natural gas fell 20% in the U.S. So, are politicians in the U.S. and Europe trying to do all they can to keep the supply going so people are able to pay their electric and heating bills this winter? Of course not. So, here is the first problem. So, the problem is that it takes a lot of time and money to build these plants in the U.S. that can liquefy natural gas and it takes a lot of time and money to build the plants in Europe that can turn the liquefied natural gas back into natural gas and put it through their pipelines. And it seems the U.S. and Europe don't want to commit to doing any of these things because it hurts their long-term green strategy. So here, progressives warn Europe against the rush to LNG reliance. So these two Democrats and 20 other colleagues in urging prudence in the build-out of natural gas import infrastructure in Europe. So they said such an effort could mean higher emission profiles in contradiction to the goals of the Paris Agreement. It is critically important that our countries not lock ourselves into decades of further reliance on fossil fuels when climate science, environmental justice, and public health concerns necessitate a rapid transition towards full renewable energy, lawmakers wrote. So that's in the U.S. Now in Europe, they say the EU energy plan centers on energy efficiency measures and more support for wind and solar, but it also emphasizes the need to fill a supply gap as it moves away from Russian energy through other suppliers of natural gas and oil. 
And so they said the European Union aims to import 50 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas from non-Russian suppliers and 10 BCM of pipeline gas. And that's roughly a third of the gas volumes that Europe imported from Russia last year. So they think they're going to get a third of what they get from Russia through LNG and some through pipeline from somewhere else. And they say those imports combined with energy savings and accelerated rollout of renewable energy could put the European Union on track to displace two-thirds of Russian imports by the end of this year. But the plan has raised concerns that Europe could be locking in future emissions through the build-out of new infrastructures. So the U.S. is saying we want Europe to replace Russian gas, but we don't really want Europe using it long term because it's not green. And Europe is saying they're going to find a way to replace two thirds of Russian energy this year. But somehow <laughs> it is not going to be a long term thing because they're going to be going green really, really soon. And so here is a chart of the natural gas that trades in Europe and you see how it shot up just from this Freeport LNG closure from about 50 to almost 150. Okay, so let's see simply what's going on between the U.S., Europe, and Russia with natural gas. Now, the U.S. prices natural gas in millions of BTUs. A BTU is a British thermal unit, which is the energy required to increase the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit whereas Europe uses megawatt hours, and a megawatt hours is a million watt hours. So think of it as a 100 watt light bulb can run for 10,000 hours on one megawatt. And the U.S. uses cubic feet, and Europe uses cubic meters. But to make everything simple, I put everything in BCM, which is billion cubic meters. So in 2020, the world usage of natural gas is 3,822 BCM. The U.S. used 832, Russia used 411, China used 330, to give you some perspective. In 2020, Europe used 541. They actually produced 219, and their imports, which were not including Russia, were 171. And imports from Russia were 155. Now, most of the natural gas that Europe gets from Russia comes through pipelines, and pipelines is the cheapest, most efficient way to transfer gas. And so, including the Nord Stream 1 and other pipelines, they send about 55 in the Nord Stream 1 and 85 in the others. That's 140 BCMs and another 15 BCMs that Russia ships through LNG ships. So a total of 155 BCMs gets exported to Europe from Russia per year. Now, the most optimistic rate of export from the U.S. of LNG is 119 BCM, and this is the level it reached recently around March. And so if you extrapolate that for the whole year, you would get about 119. This is before the Freeport shutdown. And mind you, all this 119 does not go to Europe. Before the problems with Europe, most of it was going to Asia in places like Korea and Japan. Only now has it switched so that about 70% of it is going to Europe. And normally these ships have contracts of how much they have to ship to Japan and Korea and things like that. But the prices in Europe are so good that the ships are rerouting their cargoes to Europe and paying the fines that their contracts stipulate that if they don't deliver to Asia, they have to pay a fine. So even with the fine they pay, it's still more profitable to go to Europe. So in the last few months, something like 70% of this rate is going to Europe. However, because of the Freeport LNG explosion over here, this 119 is now down to 100 at the current high rate that they were shipping around March. So about 19 less than they were before. 
So that 19 BCMs in reduction of LNG that the U.S. can produce was enough to spike the price of natural gas in Europe, who uses 541 per year. Now, add to that the problem with the Nord Stream 1 pipeline in Russia, where they had a turbine that Siemens was contracted to fix and Siemens sent it to Canada. And Canada said, oh, this is Russia's uh, turbine? We're going to sanction it and not let it get fixed and sent back. So Russia says, okay, well, if you don't fix this pipeline, which they're contracted to maintain, then the flows are going to decrease. And so instead of 55, now it's going to be like 22. So that's a 33 BCM difference in what it could send before. So that's no problem, right? They'll just make it up with more LNG imports. Well, that's not so easy. You see, the LNG imports are restricted by two things. One, the terminals that liquefy them, which there are not a lot of, and now even less because of Freeport. Two, the time and money it takes to build one when you decide to build one. Three, the amount of ships that are available to actually pick these up and send them someplace. The world fleet of LNG ships is somewhere in the neighborhood of five or 600. But you have to consider that they have to come here, fill it up, which takes like a day, send it over, which takes could take two weeks, it could take 30 days to go to Japan, and then they have to send it back empty and do it all over again. <laughs> and so that takes a lot of time and effort and money. And on top of that, how much does the average LNG ship actually carry? It carries on average 0 0.087 BCMs. So about 11 of these ships makes up one BCM. But the U.S. just lost 19 BCMs over here and possibly 33 BCMs over here. On top of that, the capacity for these terminals to regasify the LNG as it comes to Europe is not that much. Spain has a good amount. France has a good amount. Germany has none. And there is not a pipeline network from Spain to Germany. So Germany, which uses the most natural gas, has the biggest problem here. So even if they wanted to, the U.S. could not ship more LNG to Europe, more than this 100 capacity that they have. There are some plans being built in a few years, and they will add a few percentage points, 5%, 10%, something along those lines, not 50%. And with winter coming up, if this Nord Stream 1 pipeline doesn't get back up to capacity and Canada doesn't send back the turbine fixed or whatever, they don't get this back online and this stays at 22, Europe is going to have a big problem. However, what the politicians don't tell you, that there is a very simple solution to this problem. And that is Nord Stream 2. Because Nord Stream 2 was built right along Nord Stream 1 and has the same capacity, 55 BCMs per year. So even if Nord Stream 1 didn't even work, they could turn on Nord Stream 2 and, and get the same exact capacity that they had in Nord Stream 1. However, this is not licensed to operate because of sanctions, because of the war, because of all kinds of things. So the politicians... <laughs> are saying, we don't want this thing to flow into Europe and give us gas. We would rather let the people have higher food prices, have higher electricity prices, and have higher energy prices this winter. So guys, I hope this gives you a clearer picture of the reality of the situation in the natural gas markets in Europe and the U.S. If you haven't already done so, stock up on sweaters for this winter. Hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching guys.